So welcome everyone, um, the, the participants of the Poetry Academy, of course, I'm really, really excited at this culmination and celebration of how far you all have come. And to those of you who are here to support your friends and family, welcome and thank you for showing your support. Um, you are in for a treat. Uh, these lovely individuals have basically been immersing themselves in poetry for the past month. Um, there's been a lot of rigor, there's been a lot of reading assignments, writing assignments, and, and for the past four classes, they were working on editing the same draft of the poem. So not only have they been creating a lot, they've also been practicing the skills of revision and analysis and reflection. Uh, so I'm really excited to have them showcase that um, and also for them to, to perform the, the pieces that they've created over the course of the workshop, workshop and also outside of the workshop. I'm going to be introducing each of the performers and I'm not going to do it by telling you uh, what they studied or where they're from or what their hobbies are. I, I want their work to speak for themselves, but I do also feel that it is important to ground their work in some context so what I'm going to be doing as an introduction to each performer is I'm going to be reading out excerpts from, from this book, which is amazing. If, if you haven't heard of it, or if you um, are interested in, in short snippets, essays, uh, prose poetry, you should check it out. It's called Consolations, The Soulless Nourishment and Underlying Meaning of Everyday Words. And it's by David White. So I'm just gonna be reading out different excerpts um, to introduce our different performers, not necessarily because that is what defines them, but because I feel like there is some essence of that word in their work or in their personality. Um, but I'll let their poems speak for themselves. And of course, poets, if you want uh, to introduce yourselves right before you perform, or if you want to provide some context for your piece before you perform it, or the pieces before you perform them, you're free to do so as well. The last thing I'll say before beginning is that over the course of this month, we have grounded everything we've done in three values. These three values are integrity, excellence, and gratitude. So as you are performing and as you are listening today, just think about those three values and think about what that could look like for you to show excellence, to show integrity, to show gratitude, um, as people are sharing very vulnerable parts of themselves with us. Having said that, uh, we will begin. So I'm going to start by reading an excerpt from this book for the word beginning, because we're beginning, but we're also ending, but it's also a beginning. So David White says, beginning well or beginning poorly, what is important is simply to begin. But the ability to make a good beginning is also an art form. Beginning well involves a clearing away of the crass, the irrelevant and the complicated to find the beautiful, often hidden lineaments of the essential and the necessary. So this gives you a sense of, of how David White writes and there's going to be periods where um, I read out certain sections again because his language can be difficult to comprehend when you're just hearing it. Um, but I want to start by introducing the first performer. And the word that I'm going to connect this performer to is the word giving. Giving. Giving is a difficult and almost contemplative art form that has to be practiced to be done well. To learn to give is almost always the simple, sometimes heartbreaking act of just giving again. To stop giving in any situation is to call an end to the relationship. Giving is an essence of existence and a test of our character. It asks deep questions about our relationship to others, to ourselves, and strangely to time itself. 
all gifts change with the maturation of their recipients. To give well, appropriately, and often is to establish a beautiful seasonal symmetry between the urgency within us that wishes to be generous and the part of the world that is suddenly surprised and happy to receive. Um, the person who I'm introducing is Praniti. She's going to be performing a piece for us. And I wanted to read this out because throughout the course, she's somebody who has given so much of herself, um, whether it's her feedback, whether it is poems that she shares just because she feels like sharing them, um, whether it is her pursuit of feedback. So there's many ways in which she's given. And right now I, I give the stage to Pranadi to share her work with us. So thank you, Pragya ma'am, for the lovely introductions. I'll be reading out a couple of my poems today. So I like to begin with this piece, which is very close to my heart. It's a prose piece, which I've been working on through. So it's called a Hide and Seek. Okay. Yes, I like golden local fair glass bangles, the kind my mother, my family label as cheap for they are supposed to adorn the hands of the lesser privileged. But I love them, I hold them close, the kind with gleaming paints glitter coated, for they assure me that wet dark shadows is not the legacy of all of humankind. And some leave glittery trails and footprints of shine and shimmer upon the ground on which they tread. And in my life, this glittery trail, this golden shadow is the legacy of your presence. I am three years old, or maybe four or five, but not a year older than five. In fact, I am scared of being even a minute older than five for the fear that it may rip open the soft, carefully cushioned layers of my dreams. I'm running the courtyard of your house, your house mind it, not my house, and I'm looking at the clouds. My toddler's eyes trying their best to capture the shape-shifting brilliance of these balls of wool. Suddenly, suddenly I hear the sound of your car's horn, followed by the sound of you concluding a call with someone. As I hear your footsteps, I turn around, spin around abruptly and without caring about who's listening, because people don't usually judge a five-year-old, I cry out in joy on the top of my lungs and fling, us, fling myself into your arms. And just like Amir Khan lifts Ishan in his embrace and throws him into the sky in the ending scene of the movie Tare Zameen Par, and the way Ishan's spread out hands and stretched out palms aim for the stars, my hands and palms behave the same way. And as I stay in a suspended midair position, I know there is a pair of strong arms waiting to catch me. I know that this pair of strong arms won't let me fall. After this, I run away and indulge in a game of hide and seek, choosing one of the darkest places under the staircase. Of course, as always, I am scared of the rats, lizards and mice that lurk in this pitch darkness that hold the darkness on their backs, a darkness that is so dark there is no space for even a single star. But somehow, my three-year-old heart is completely assured that I will not have to wait as long. I know you will pull me out of this dark place and hold me to your heart and laugh. I wouldn't know why you were laughing back then, but seeing your eyes flicker with light, light that goes on and off, my toddler's heart does not hesitate to create a direct analogy between the lights of your eyes and stage lights. After all, the lights of your eyes are what shimmer upon my part of the world, upon my stage. In short, your joy is my joy. Suddenly, as your laughter comes to a stop, I burst out laughing. But today, after I have counted till 222, you don't come. I don't know where you've gone. As I emerge out of the dark, my eyes clouded with emotion that is most definitely too strong and too intense for such a young heart. But as they say, an emotion is an emotion, no matter how strong or weak. 
the emotion that clouds the void the whites of my eyes is despair how i yearn to tell you that all the times i rejoiced after winning a game of hide and seek against you was not the joy of victory but the joy of watching you look for me the joy of hearing you call out my name and i had especially revel in the times i could not be found and watch the way you'd frown the way your voice would touch a point of shrillness which was in simpler words a point of urgency there is so much of joy in watching you look for me cut i am 17 my eyes brim over with dreams as i go and make eye contact with the world around me i want to become a writer and the world isn't for me on that but you are but from a distance is it because i am a young woman now a young woman who cannot be held close because you never know what people might say at the end of the day you aren't my father or my mother or any close relative so to speak and as a horrifying pandemic grips the world in its iron cold fingers i feel as though these iron cold fingers are sifting through the layers of my being i feel these fingers highlighting the voids in my heart my friends idolize actors and sportsmen and cover their walls with lost up posters and as the world shut outside i opened within and i became the five year old kid again i ran through the courtyards of your house despite being confided within the courtyards of my abode i feel tiny wings pushing through the spine of my pen as within the four walls of my room i feel these wings beating to a rhythm a rhythm that creates a new beautiful world it is this world where i exist the way i wish to and you exist the way i want you to exist today i want to tell you that i am lost i am in the dark spaces beneath a staircase that i have constructed and carved for myself how do i tell you that i want to be looked for and i want to be called out for and how do i tell you that i want to notice that expression that twilight pause between two emotions when your face that is otherwise confident is on the verge of crumpling into tears simply because it cannot find me in a game of hide and seek is it possibly crossing a line when i tell you that i want to be worried about this is my first poem and the second poem that i am going to read out is called purple poems um a little okay i'll be reading purple poems out there is a purple poem on my mother's neck that my father writes for her every full moon night every full moon night instead most poets write on paper but my father writes on mother's skin she smiles she says she does not mind says the purple poem is truly a thing of pride and beauty is truly a thing of pride and beauty yet she keeps it covered carefully with the ends of her dupatta shielding it says she is scared of it being looked at by the evil eye by the evil eye there is a purple poem on my mother's hand that my father writes for her every full moon night instead most poems have words but it is a shape poem my mother insists sits me down before the computer makes me look at some but does not ask me to write one i wonder why i wonder why there is a purple poem on my mother's forehead that my father writes for her every full moon night instead instead it has not been written tenderly upon the softness of paper with a gliding quill it has been pummeled pushed slapped stamped and smashed probably the way mom punches walnuts into the dough of our winter cake so that the walnut stays i think father also wishes for this purple poem to permanently stay there is a purple poem there is a purple poem on my mother's feet that my father writes for her every full moon night and tonight as i reach out my fingers measuring the dark ensuring my steps are silent i tread with caution so as to not arise her i touch this purple poem which she says 
is a treasure and honor a privilege a boon and even at times a wife's pride her sleep crusted eyes flicker open and she winces so that's the, these are the two poems that i had for today who um i don't know what to say it, it what a what a powerful beginning to this celebration thank you for sharing both of those pieces with us vanity as we process and and digest what the beautiful words and imagery that pandavanati has shared with us i'm going to be introducing our next performer our next performer is zara and the word that i am going to be talking about from this book by david white called constellations the word is confession confession is a stripping away of protection the telling of truth which might once have seemed like a humiliation becomes suddenly a gateway an entrance to solid ground even a first step home to confess is to free oneself not only by admitting a sin or an omission but to profess a deeper allegiance a greater dedication to something beyond the mere threat of immediate punishment or the desolation of being shunned to confess is to declare oneself ready for a more courageous road one in which a previously defended identity might not only be shorn away but be seen to be irrelevant a distraction a working delusion that kept us busy over the years and held us unaccountable to the real question confession and with that i hand the stage to zada thanks very much i'll be performing two of my poems um the first one has two titles and here goes it's called the politics of childhood or i think you should have this kitten i think you should have this kitten even if it displeases your mother many things you go on to do with it even if it takes some effort to remember to clean out its sandbox to check it for fleas i think you should have this kitten because others commend you for wisdom beyond your nine earthly years i've seen you or have i we only ever see ourselves in others the cavernous black of your eyes and the same choice once presented to me the seductive tumble into despair or the soft tedium of the everyday you might hear it's all the same really that as surely as 3 and 5 transport you to 8 so do 2 and 6 here's a secret though the arithmetic of self discovery is not linear we scrawl it on shifting sands where waves of shoulds and woulds have their smug way with it and i cannot promise you your castles will endure they are nevertheless worth the building I think you should have this kitten as a reminder of our original innocence, the place we've all come from and to which we will all return. A soft purr drawing you out of self-doubt, like a thread of silk in a web tethering you to a lighter world. As it naps on you in silent hot afternoons when your parents are asleep and the earth is taking a long inhale. um thanks very much the next poem um is called girl boss you're too bossy she says explaining her rejection of my friendship i feel the searing pain of loss which follows me over years inhibiting my natural outspokenness stifling my instinct to lead only much later when i see men behave exactly the way i always did exactly the way i wanted to and people call them leaders do i reach out and hug my 12 year old self giving her her rightful name of girl boss that was amazing zara you are definitely a girl boss at all ages i can i can see that <laughs> 
Thank you for sharing your work with us. All right. Our next poet, our next poet is going to be Manika. And the word that I would like to present Manika with is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a skill, a way of preserving clarity sanity and generosity in an individual life. A beautiful way of shaping the mind to a future we want for ourselves. An admittance that a forgiveness comes through understanding and if understanding is just a matter of time and application, then we might as well begin forgiving right at the beginning of any drama rather than put ourselves through the full cycle of festering, incapacitation, reluctant healing, and eventual blessing. To forgive is to put oneself in a larger gravitational field of experience than the one that first seemed to hurt us. We reimagine ourselves in the light of our maturity, and we reimagine the past in the light of our new identity. We allow ourselves to be gifted by a story larger than the story that first hurt us and left us bereft. So Monica's work is very powerful because it's it's grounded in this it's grounded in this honesty, and I'm really excited um, to have Monica present her work to us. Monica, the stage is yours. Thank you, Pragya. That was lovely. Um, I was going to share the screen and read the poetry because. I'm really nervous, but I'm trying to be brave, so I'm just gonna perform it. <laughs> so my first poem is uh, Broken Dolls. Innocent lips silenced by shame. Old wounds fresh as rotting compost. Imaginary friends replaced by barren land. Crippled legs carry shadows of what could have been. Undercurrents to hell, cocaine. The pain, inconceivable. How broken a spirit must be when be gone can look comforting. Time piercing like a misfired bullet, snapping muscles perhaps will lax. Bone by bone we will rebuild. Here's wishing self, compassion. You're worth nothing. Invite trouble yet again. Ugly inside out. Water will not wash away memories of sliding fingers up the frock, bartered childhood for a talk, ma overworked, flustered, unable to see, devil coating her little baby. Finally awake at their wake, gathering courage, shame, their intestines, they finally speak their truth. Here's wishing the world compassion. You're not the only one, such a liar. Your cousin's not like that. Maybe it was just your imagination. Just that. Awkward silence. Your words sound like acid, but they have said far worse to themselves. Bone by bone, we will rebuild. Here's wishing us humanity. Broken dolls discarded. It was just a wild play. Their fleeting memories let them fly away. Okay. So my second poem is, um, I've tried to make it humorous. I don't know if it's funny, but <laughs> yeah. So it's called Hair Story. Ouch, woman, that hurt. Tell that in hairstylist, the hairbrush feels like dried cactus raking up autumn leaves. I'm just as natural and valid as the rest, but the embarrassment you feel to see me on legs or God forbid on your sacred feminine. Why cannot I gray or lie flat? It's unnatural to see you distressed when I bear the heat of it, pun intended. Running fingers through me while you flutter your craft project on your eyelash. Your love for me is purely convenience. Hail the crowning glory and these days a bushy brow. I exist for reasons beyond beauty. I have purpose, but you are ready with all your paraphernalia to obliterate me. Here reduction costs morality. 
stinky eggs, promised perfume, magic potions, obnoxious green juices glucked down like forced glasses of Malai milk, horrid ceramic rods that bake me into different shapes. The ultimate battle strategy, thread, soaked in stranger's spit, yanks me out one by one. Suffocating me in chocolate brown, satin blondes and glossy finish, Medusa, clipping in another human head on my tender roots needling in color to make me look fuller. Baba Yaga, relax. Accept me, love me, just as the rest of you. Correction, your precious Chanel. Thinning, graying, standing electrified, popping up in weird places, it's just the whimsical me. Tame me all you want. I am the Sun Tzu of war. <laughs> I feel like everything my mother would say when she was combing my hair as a child was, was coming back. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Very, very amusing. Thread was my favorite part. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. So those of you who are new to um, this space, you can see that, or rather you can hear and, and see that we are amongst so much talent and power and beauty and it's been pretty amazing to work with these individuals. So our next performance um, is by an individual that I've had the pleasure to work with for the second time, Devika. And uh, with Devika, I want to read about the word gratitude. Gratitude, as I mentioned at the beginning, is is one of the values that um, that we focused on in this course. And I would like to read about gratitude. Gratitude is the understanding that many millions of things come together and live together and mesh together and breathe together in order for us to take even one more breath of air. That the underlying gift of life and incarnation as a living, participating human being is a privilege, that we are miraculously part of something rather than nothing. Even if that something is temporarily pain or despair, we inhabit a living world with real faces, real voices, laughter, the color blue, the green of the fields, the freshness of a cold wind, or the tawny hue of a winter landscape. To sit among friends and strangers, hearing many voices, strange opinions, to intuit inner lives beneath surface lives, to inhabit many worlds at once in this world, to be a someone amongst all other someones, and therefore to make a conversation without saying a word is to deepen our sense of presence and therefore our natural sense of thankfulness that everything happens both with us and without us, that we are participants and witness all at once. It, it's great to, to be an MC when the words are not yours. So I'm just gonna plug it again. David White, amazing book, <laughs> check it out. And, and with that, um, I introduce David to you all. Thank you so much, Pragya. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to begin with uh, one out of the two poems I'm going to read today. Uh, they're both part of my uh, white series. So here goes. The White Knight. There were four of us last night. Four of us and the bright moon. A special blue moon, the Sharad Purnima, though in it we found no color. It was a brazen ochre when I was walking earlier, round, full and beautiful. We sat welcoming this late dark night in the turn of the season. Not a star to look at, but the air festive and clear as ice. We sat as people do when they have somewhere to be, yet nowhere to go. Maybe that was just me. Something brought us together, four people sitting in their own lives under the gaze of the full moon. The camphor, the hot tea, and the coconut laddus, ras. This some time of the night, white, shone an in individual delight. 
What makes you a seeker? I do not know. I am a believer. And right now, blue remains the night and its moon spots. So my second poem is called Man Made White. And here goes. Returning to my newfound Man Made White of Chirmi Palace, I'm tucked in after hours with the Scrabble app. No swipe left or right for me. And every once in a while, a triple word is thrilling. I word up and down as I please. No worry of strangers or unwanted messages. I am with old and new words. I play with friends, acquaintances, and strangers. A bunch of us with an 1820 average score play in twosomes. Some play fast, some go slow. Almost a year of this uninterrupted fix until a message shows up. It was a late night game. Not that I play those much. I wanted to quietly unwind forming some words when he messaged. Shall we continue tomorrow? Yes, I promptly responded. I looked at the time. With no friend in sight, peace at times is not organic. With no friend in sight, peace is also opaque. It is channelized, sought and provoked. And like a modern refurbishment of an antiquated past is man-made. After some days, I said, I like this app because no one messages. He laughed. He has two more Scrabble friends. And I thought, good for him. It's a Scrabble life these days. I woke up thinking, I need to figure a no message option, else I'll lose my peaceful Scrabble vibe. He's too young. Don't go all stalker on me, I told him. You too, came the snarky reply. Board game rapo has nothing to do with age, gender, and type. Last evening, I made my first Scrabble friend. One is plenty already. Sivika, this, this piece, both of them actually, but the second one especially, is so relevant in times like these when, when we're having open mics over Zoom and when we're, you know, creating communities of our own and those communities are not necessarily based on where we're located but things that we're interested in and I think that's really magical um, and this poem was a wonderful example of that both of them actually so thank you for sharing those with us let us move on to our next performer her name is Mayra and she's very talented and I'm not going to tell you anything else about her, but I am going to talk about a word. And the word I'm going to talk about is heartbreak, as in the breaking of hearts. Okay. Heartbreak is unpreventable. The natural outcome of caring for people and things over which we have no control, of holding in our affections, those who inevitably move beyond our line of sight. Heartbreak begins the moment we are asked to let go, but cannot. In other words, it colors and inhabits and magnifies each and every day. Heartbreak is not a visitation. I'm going to say that again. It rings really true. Heartbreak is not a visitation, but a path that human beings follow through even the most average life. Heartbreak is an indication of our sincerity. In a love relationship, in a life's work, in trying to learn a musical instrument, in the attempt to shape a better, more generous self. Heartbreak is the beautifully helpless side of love and affection and is just as much an essence, an emblem of care as the spiritual athlete's quick but abstract ability to let go. Heartbreak has its own way of inhabiting time and its own beautiful and trying patience in coming and going. But heartbreak may be the very essence of being human, of being on the journey from here to there, and of coming to care deeply for what we find along the way. So to share wisdom about going from here to there on this journey of heartbreak, I present to you all, Myra. 
Hi guys, I'm Myra. So I'm going to perform a very musical piece. I'm only performing one poem of mine, and it's really like long and it's uh, more of a performance piece, I guess. So I'll begin. Why is a man say only fools rush? But I can't fall in love. Adam ate it. Romeo could survive it. Hitler forbade it. The Almighty gave it. Call it a curse, call it a blessing. The nights have been marked in the memory of who we used to call us. Shall I stay? said with a rose in his hands you won't realize it now it's thorns pricking his fingers and tears rolling down his eyes i'm still in love with your flaws is what is beyond me and it hurts to see you smile while i wish you were still mine take my Take my whole life too. Oh, if I can fall in love with you. You see, when I was 16, I dreamed. I dreamed of a place where I could sit pure, sitting next to the guy I love. Play some guitar, look at the stars, dance like there's no one there. Talk about the irony of love with the people who say it just for me to undress. See the world through his eyes and realize I couldn't care less. Be up all night under the sky so bright, your eyes looking into mine. Like the swirl of wine, and to my disguise, I realized I don't like the taste of beer. Take my hand, take my whole life to Oh, if I can help. But now when I look back, it hurts. It hurts to see how happy you made me or how many smiles you brought on my face or how many times you lent me your shoulder to cry on. It hurts to count the number of times your kisses healed my heart or your shoulder brought a, gave me a place to lie on. And I guess now I'm just jealous of the old me because she had you and you completed her with perfection. Beautiful, Myla, in, in so many ways. I mean, of course, the way that you wove music and your own lyrics and rhythm, and, and actually that is what poetry is, and, and, you, and you've done it. That was lovely. Thank you. So our next performer is going to be Yashtika. And... For Yashtika, I'm going to introduce her with the word friendship. 
friendship. Through the eyes of a real friendship, an individual is larger than their everyday actions. And through the eyes of another, we receive a greater sense of our own personhood. I'm going to say that part again because I feel like it has a lot of power. Through the eyes of a real friendship, an individual is larger than their everyday actions. And through the eyes of another, we receive a greater sense of our own personhood. The one we can aspire to, the one in whom they have the most faith. Friendship is a moving frontier of understanding, not only of the self and the other, but also of a possible and as yet unlived future. So Yashtika's, the, some of the work that, that she's going to be sharing with us today is grounded in the complexities of friendship and, and how challenging, but at the same time, um, how self-reflecting it is to navigate those spaces. So with that, I, I present to you all Yashtika. Yashtika, the stage is yours. So the first poem I'm gonna be performing is called um, Just Impulse. Dil ki suno, entering the famous airport scene. I don't love her. I don't know if I love her. I, she's leaving forever, suddenly an impulse opens the anywhere door, I love you. Dil ki suno is equal to impulse, hence proved. I left the love of my life, entering vacuum. I had no emotional baggage, just impulse. I can't show you the real me, I'm too afraid to lose you. I felt enlightened because I read two pages about the subconscious mind. Tell yourself you're positive and you become positive. Entering the Super Mario game. I shut my eyes. I pick no coins. Fight no turtles. I only run, jump, escape. Entering the next level. The two dimensions suddenly felt like three. Marched towards me, the turtles, 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 spinning shells, fireball, the king of turtles, fireball, fireball, pokey, lava, pokey, birds cornering me into the bottomless pit. I recognized one of the turtles, the one I couldn't see. He missed me too, cornering me into my airport and entering air beating up against the walls of vacuum. I love you, my impulse. Um, so the next piece I'm going to be performing is called um, Waves of Love. I love you. I love you so much. You make me cry so much. I am too afraid of everything. I keep coming back to the horror house. I want to feel the presence of you, the vague presence, the terrifying presence. I want to kiss your long hand, witchy fingers. I want to feel your hopefully not blank face. I don't know if this is love, my head, is filled with blood. I keep waiting for you to look back. I can't love anyone else, it's you, because you're terrifying. I wanna push you, push you into the sea, drown you. Don't come back with the waves. I wanna come back to you. I wanna drown with you. Drown and feel the slow water rising and us drowning somewhere between life and death. I want our futile clothes to flow out of us. I want to drown every day looking at your eyes. I want to be monotonous with you, stuck, stuck in a time loop with you. I want to want us both to fill in the depressing negative space between our fingers. I want to feel the rashes on your back, your hairy underarms, your protruding chest and your covered organic rib cage. I want to kiss your hairy navel. Am I someone else right now? I want us to be devoid of gravity and let our long vivid hair flow wild. I want to shut my eyes and, and feel you with my nose closest to the grossest smell you produce. 
I want to be an Indian goddess with 10 hands and feel everything, everything you are, while humming the vacuum between life and death. Let me come back to the home. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those Yashtika. They were, they were well worth the wait. I am, I am grateful that um, we got to hear what's going on in that mind of yours, converted into poetry. Another thing I want to say about Yashtika is that, the, so the first poem that she performed um, is the one that she worked on editing four times and it has come such a long way. I am so proud of, of what, it's, what it's become, what it was, but also what it's become. So definitely lots of learning. Last but not the least, uh, we're going to be hearing from Dikshita. And the word that I'm going to introduce Dikshita with is honesty. I feel Dikshita has a lot of honesty in her work. And she doesn't, she doesn't avoid addressing things that are uncomfortable. And I really, really like that about her work. So honesty. The ability to speak the truth is as much the ability to describe what it is like to stand in trepidation at this door as it is to actually go through it and become that beautiful, honest, spiritual warrior equal to all circumstances we would like to become. Honesty is not the revealing of some foundational truth that gives us power over life or another or even the self, but a robust incarnation into the unknown, unfolding vulnerability of existence, where we acknowledge how powerless we feel, how little we actually know, how afraid we are of not knowing and how astonished we are by the generous measure of loss that is conferred upon even the most average life. Honesty is grounded in humility and indeed in humiliation and in admitting exactly where we are powerless. Honesty is not found in revealing the truth, but in understanding how deeply afraid of it we are. To become honest is, in fact, to become fully and robustly incarnated into powerlessness. Honesty allows us to live without knowing. We do not know the full story. We do not know where we are in the story. We do not know who is at fault or who will carry the blame in the end. Honesty is not a weapon to keep loss and heartbreak at bay. It is the outer diagnostic of our ability to come to ground in reality, the hardest attainable ground of all, the place where we actually dwell, the living, breathing frontier where there is no realistic choice between gain or loss. And I feel like this is a great, great way to, to end the open mic because, because while what Dikshita is going to be sharing with us comes from a very honest place, so is the work that everyone has courageously shared with us. Um, and for that, I'm immensely grateful. With that, I present to you all Dikshita. Thank you, Pragya. So I'll be sharing uh, one poem only. Uh, to be or not to be amphibian. I'm not an amphibian. I live at land as an amorist from the sand, who sweeps fast from the gaps of fingers like celery tea, and then accumulates in the grainy ground, waiting for someone to pick me up again. Ma loves the water, but she's not the water. She's only expected to be. Acting as an appendage to her family's documents, she is not free. My wedding is two days far, so I invited my family on a road trip and decided to open the chits from the transparent jar to understand what love was and to find out more about the amphibians. 
brother thought he was a halcyon in the helicopter, looking for a partner to share his cigarette with, having no idea of what love is or what was his. In the midst of discussing about what was security, the differing opinions became an evidence of a shaky treaty. Ma stopped the car dad was driving and asked me to accompany her in the open vicinity. He heard us that dad was like a fluorescent flickering bulb who threw his cigarette ashes in a long cylindrical box. Then he placed a lid on it. I now know toxic amphibians are bright colored. After ages, he opened the lid. The box exploded. Some ashes went on his eyes. My ma was the box. He gave me everything except love after 2008, but the ringworm rashes magically reappear again and again. What about me? The men I loved yesterday became strangers, and tomorrow I will become a stranger for the strangers I meet today. We went back to the car to see dad unable to breathe and brother unable to save him. Amphibians are cold-blooded. Too much sun and wind can damage their skin. In that little time I got to reflect, I imbibed some useful amphibian proteins and realized that my family members were on distinctively dissimilar driver's seats of the same car. My father thinks our family is a square. My mother thinks we are a circle. But aren't we a triangle where someone always becomes a midpoint for the diverged point of views and the equation remains unsolved? Where did those days go when we traveled cities in autos, where we would break the rules and travel in the autos which did not allow more than three people? And now when we have the car, for the four of us, some are complaining of the leg space. Here, everyone is writing a poem or a song when no one is looking. Everyone is singing at a distance and the others are clapping at lyrics unrelated. Where have the years gone? A deaf family have we become? Everyone says that when nothing works and heartbreaks happen, you come back to your family. But when the scars are already here, where do you go? When the sun will set, we all will be tired. When the sun will rise tomorrow, unlike others, will we have the strength to start all over again? In this journey, some lost identity, some lost love, some could not get an entry, some lost a war. When my vision started to become sharp and I found out I could be the saucer to my own cup, that's when I became an amphibian and decided to take a U-turn. Or maybe I just saw the broken bridge approach. Thank you. Okay. Um, that was also, I feel like, when we started the open mic, it started with so much power and I feel like it's ended with so much power. So thank you, Bikshita, for, for giving us those, those lingering images. I think what stuck with me is this idea of a triangle and how we look for a midpoint and and how in a car we're searching for leg space, even though we've, we've traveled with in, in more cramped conditions. Um, but thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. With that, um, I want to once again thank all of you for attending, both the performers and uh, the audience members. Thank you for your support and encouragement and expressions of, of gratitude throughout the open mic. Um, and I'm just really glad to be a part of this process. Ashwarya, did you have anything you'd like to add as, as closing remarks? Thank you everyone for joining in and for actually thank you to all the participants for, you know, really having the courage to read and perform your poems out. And, you know, for me as someone who has actually heard all of them for the first time, it was so, so amazing to hear each and everyone's poem and to see how each poem was so powerful in its own way. Yeah. So I really, really enjoyed being here. And, you know, thank you so much, all of you for doing this and for everyone who has joined in to listen to your poems and the space that we've been able to create here. 
and also thank you to the members of uh, the quarantine train who came and listened to some of the poems here. Um, yeah, so that is all, <laughs> all I have to say is thank you. <laughs>